Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 38, The End of Latin and the Beginning of Brythonic. At the end of the 4th century, all the literacy in Wales and Roman Britain was based in Latin. It was the language of trade, of military correspondence, and the administration. Without Latin, you could not communicate with much of the wider world. Much like my own native language, English, everyone in the empire and surrounding area probably knew at least the swear words. British or Brythonic was heavily affected by the influence of Latin. Professor Charles Edwards argued that one could say it was a Romance language. He did that based on the amount of Latin words in the language and the effects it had on modern Welsh. In all, there are 800 Latin words that, are, that made it directly into modern Welsh. This pales in comparison with English, where 29% of all English words have Latin roots. But that may be due more to the influence of one of the other major root languages of English, which is French. By the 5th century, in Britain and Wales in particular, this was already changing. As we mentioned previously, the British language, or Brythonic, was making a comeback, or at least becoming more obvious. With the Irish came Ogham, a form of written Proto-Gaelic. Over the next 500 years, these combinations of Ogham, Brythonic, and Latin would form roots the new language Welsh. To compare how Welsh came to be, we can look at the origins of English. Originally, Old English was the language of the Germans in Britain and probably in all likelihood in parts of northern Germany for a while. It was influenced mildly by those who joined the Saxon culture from Britain, but most of the meat of the language remains distinctly German in flavor. If you heard poems read in Old English, they sound very Germanic. There is a definite guttural Germanic tone to it, which one can easily see as being rooted in the same language that is spoken in Germany today. However, it is very different from our current English, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Like I said, it was originally influenced by the Celts. Uh, it was further influenced by the Latin influence, both from the Celtic language, from the Christian church, and by the arrival of others that we'll talk about shortly. Then we have the Danes and Norwegians who arrive in the 9th and 10th century. With the Viking legacy, there was a change to a number of things from place names like York or Jorvik, and also in some of the uses of words. This is the re one of the reasons why we get things like three twos and three theirs and things like that comes out of this Viking heritage combining with the English heritage. With the arrival, however, of the Norman and the French to the island, we have what would be a good analog for the influence of Latin during the Roman period. French became the language of court, of administration, and of noble life, while rural and urban peasants continued to speak English. Over time and out of changing fortunes of various kings, the obvious need to rally the people, English won the day. But this English that arrived in what we would call Middle English is not the English of the Old English. It is an English influenced by previous invasions and previous cultural contact, and the Middle English that we know of becomes the Shakespearean language, which is again very different once more, and this language is heavily influenced by French effects and French word usage. So, of course, English, much like Welsh, has been heavily influenced by other languages and other people. Because of this, we have a language that is very different today from a language that would be a Romance language. In English, there is not the same sort of masculine and feminine uses that we have in a Romantic language, and yet it's not a Germanic language really anymore because of the influences of these other words. A lot of English words are heavily influenced by French sources. And just the way you say certain things are heavily influenced, and the usage of spelling can be influenced by the French language. So, in some ways, it had a large effect on the language in a way that the Celts didn't. And if we look at Brythonic, it's almost a very similar type of situation, but much older. Brythonic is a language that likely began 
at the very latest in the Iron Age. It is a language that did not have a written and never had a written version of it. Uh, in fact, all of the writings that we have are either in Latin or in Proto-Welsh or in Ogham. We do not have a Brythonic written inscription or book or paper or anything or scroll that can be found and dated and identified as Brythonic. So we don't really know what Brythonic was other than through some origin words, obvious spellings, place names, and especially the names of tribal leaders and things that we have from the Roman era, which are obviously not Roman names, that obviously came from Brythonic, and of course carried on into Old Welsh. And so we do have recognizable parts to it, but it's not like we can say, yeah, this is definitely what Old Brythonic sounded like. We can make some guesses. Academics often do. They're relatively educated and informed from other sources. And it helps you to get an idea of what a language might have sounded like, what their word usage was. But as we know from Old Latin versus Middle Age Latin, things can change, even the sounds of things can change. So thus, in Old Latin or Latin of the Classical period, you would say what we now say as Caesar would be pronounced Kaiser, because of course they had a hard C, not a soft C. The idea of the old Veni Vidi Vici from the classic Caesar quote is actually more likely in classical pronunciation Veni Vidi Vici. So in other words, it was W sound rather than a V sound. And these kind of things aren't easily picked up on if you don't have evidence, if you don't have written languages. The reasons why we have a decent idea what things sounded like in classical Latin is because writers of the day were writing on grammar and on pronunciation and complaining much like modern people do about the pronunciation and writings of other people and talking about the right and wrong ways of doing things. And so we know that it definitely sounded different from what we know now. We don't have a measurable equivalent, obviously, with Brythonic because there isn't one. There just isn't any evidence of any sort of written record. And this likely comes down to the fact that it may have been a secondary language in trade, because of course, Latin was the lingua franca of Rome. And so thus, if you wanted to trade with other people, if you wanted to make transactions, it was written in Latin. The other thing is the administration, the military, everything was carried out in Latin. So it makes sense that it would be the primary language. The other truth is, is that Britain, written sources are hard to find because of the decomposable nature of the British climate. The paper doesn't last terribly well in a climate which is heavily humid and not necessarily always well protected. We're lucky we have some of the stuff we have simply because there was lots of those versions of documents around and eventually one or two would get through. The writings of Gildas simply survives because we have a lot of evidence of it. The writings of Bede survives because there's a lot of evidence of it. If it wasn't for the amount of documents that were copied and transferred from year to year, from decade to decade to millennia, you wouldn't have any of this stuff. And there's a lot of evidence that a lot of the documents, you know, the earliest version of a lot of our documents are not that old comparatively. So for us, this is one of the influences on our modern day understanding of things. So if we don't have a written record of Brythonic, it makes it very difficult. And it makes it even harder to say, oh yeah, this is what it would have sounded like. This is how it would have worked. It would have had some similarities to Old Welsh, some similarities to Gaelic, some similarities to Latin. Here's all the influences and as you go. We just don't have that evidence. And it's not for lack of trying, obviously. And like I said, academics, uh, linguists and things, they, they do their best with what we have and what we do have, but we can never be entirely sure if they're right. Now, remember that Brythonic or Proto-Welsh likely existed before the arrival of the Romans, as I said before. And in fact, many place names, people and tribes were still called in their ancient Iron Age names in the Roman period. While Latin was the language of government and religion, Brythonic was likely the language of the everyday person. However, it is hard to prove that, as I said. When we look at other examples, though, it does make sense. And we look at words and say likely that they had Brythonic roots. 
But what we do know is that there is no evidence of anything written in Brythonic, as I said again. This likely shows that Brythonic was not the language of literature or the literate. It was likely more a rural and base language, much like Anglo-Saxon's English became after the Norman invasion. And because of that, it didn't get used as much, and it never really became a written language. There was no reason to. Also, what also needs to be taken into account is that all along the Western Britain, there were, as there are in English, different dialects of Brythonic. Just as South Welsh and North Welsh have different accents, different ways of stressing pronunciation, uh, for example, my great aunt, who I talked to on the phone quite often and actually went and saw when I was in Britain, lived in, in a place called Hru in the, in the northern part of we Northwest Wales. And her way of pronouncing things was remarkably different than, say, someone from Cardiff or even from the valleys in the south. The stresses for them were much more about R and rolling the R, whereas in the south it was much more like this up and down. And so you had a very different sound to each of them. And this is probably influenced by the isolation from each other. And of course, the influence of the English in the South, which of course we know about and we'll cover in great detail as we go through this series. Uh, and also what things are called changes from place to place. Uh, as examples, let's think about the room that has a toilet, a sink, and a, sometimes a bathtub. In Britain, I've heard it called a loo, a WC, or a toilet. In Canada, we typically call it a washroom or a bathroom. In America, it's a bathroom or a restroom. And you can see that even in there, there are slight differences and slight changes. And if you say washroom in some places, they won't know what you're talking about. They'll point to something very different. Or if you say restroom, people are like, you need to lay down. You know. All of these things are just little variations, but they're huge when you think about it, because in some ways, they control how you interact with people. I remember when I first got to Britain, one of the biggest confusions I had was trying to get a hold of information from telephone, you know, talking to an operator and trying to find out a number of someone. Because in, at that time, in Canada and in the United States, you would obviously call the number 411. And I say obviously, because in North America, that's fairly obvious. and it's, I think it's relatively more obvious outside of North America than our views of other people's connection points. So when I went to try and figure out what the number of this person I was looking up in Bristol, I couldn't do it because I couldn't figure out how to call information. And I had to actually go ask someone to help me. The other big difference from a cultural standpoint, and it's one of those little things and they don't make a huge amount of difference until you start to, to think about it is coinage, because of course coinage in Britain is very different than in Canada and the United States. The Canadian and the United States coinage looks relatively the same. The only difference is what the denomination looks like as far as what's on the coin, but the size and the actual number association are generally the same. The basic differences in Canadian money, of course, is that there is now no longer a penny, for example, uh, but there is a $1 and $2 coin, which, of course, isn't in the United States. Conversely, there is a $1 and $2 pound coin in Britain, so they've got a similar sort of coinage system. Um, but like the 10 pence piece looks like a, like a, five, a nickel or a 5 cents piece in Canada and the United States, and then a 10 cent coin in North America looks like a 5 cent coin, a 5 pence coin in Britain. So little differences from all sorts of different ways culturally influence the language, influence the people. And so you end up with this whole concept that now all of a sudden, as they get more and more divided, much like in Britain now, where you have different accents depending on what part of Britain you're from, and Wales has different accents within it, and, and they can be like right next door, that kind of carries over to this ancient time where the language is starting to change and form and harden. There are subtle and then somewhat drastic differences from areas. And as they get more and more isolated, in other words, as the Saxons move forward and slowly cut off the south 
the West and the North from each other, that language change gets more and more abrupt to the point where while there's some relationship between them, it's more like Portuguese versus Spanish. Yeah, I can hear you and I understand you, but only just. And that's kind of what happens over time. You have this drastic change, much like Irish Gaelic and Scottish Gaelic is a companion language, a family language with Welsh and Cornish and Breton. It is not the same language that you can't just cross over and say, okay, I totally recognize what you're saying. It's more difficult than that. A lot like I, I would actually say very similar to a lot of uh, the Nordic languages where there is some similarity, but they're very difficult to understand one another. And I think that has to do with the isolation. It has to do with the separation, be it island nations being separated by water or by political separation, which then creates this opportunity for things to, to diverge. And so Old Welsh then comes out of that diversion. And now it is no longer known as Brythonic or, Brit or the language of Britons. Now this language is slowly being changed, and so too is the understanding of what a Briton is. And in Wales, this change becomes Cymru. So the name of the people, the name of the language, is now affected. And now the idea of Cumbragi, or companions, is now important, or landholders, or all the variations of what that means. And so the people, or the countrymen, or the comrades, and their language is now totally different than what was gone before. And now, no longer are these people seeing themselves as Britons. They're seeing themselves as Cymru, or Cumbrogi. And in other words, countrymen are comrades of each other. Not British anymore, but actually Welsh, to use the Saxon term, of course. And so they call themselves this name. The Saxons, of course, call them Welsh or Welsh, which can mean either... It has two different meanings, depending on who you're talking to. Welsh can mean a stranger or foreigner, which is kind of ironic. Or it also can mean Roman, or Roman British in this case. And I think that actually has some interesting understandings, because if you look at the sources, especially if you look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, they don't call them Welsh there, they call them British. So that idea that they're Roman Britons and that that would actually maintain itself and that would sort of be what Welsh meant does make more sense than, say, this concept or understanding of the language which stretches in a different way and becomes, you know, calling people who lived here their whole lives and their ancestors' whole lives going back multiple millennia foreigners seems very ironic. Now, it doesn't make it untrue. It just, it's just kind of a weird idea. So the language, as I said, migrates, but the interesting thing of it is, is even as it changes, even as it merges, this is still the oldest language in Britain. It's still the elderly statesman of the languages in Britain. It's existed, we think, as far back as 2000 BC, at the end of the Stone Age, the beginnings of the early Bronze Age, all the way till now, or in other words, to this cutoff point between Welsh and Brythonic. And its descendant Welsh isn't completely dissimilar. So here's a language which has been around since the beginning, effectively, when language became a big enough thing to be important, and the way everyone communicated to each other in Britain. And now it's divided, and it's separated, and it's segregated into regions. And these languages will again change again and again and again as the influence of the English to the various areas, to the influence of the Scotti in Scotland to the southern half of Scotland, which is still at this point British, becomes more Scottish and influenced by all sorts of different things. All of these things change dramatically in a very, I wouldn't say a short period of time, but within a hundred years, you see a dramatic shift from Brythonic to Welsh, and it all happens around the same time as this cutoff happened. It's pretty well documented that by the 700s, we have Welsh 
and it starts to become a written language, which is the first time a Brythonic language is actually starting to get written down, and records and inscriptions are being kept in Welsh for the first time. And again, this whole feeling of uniqueness and unity around this language, this language of your comrades, the language of your fellow countrymen, is so important to Wales. And this is where it really starts. This is the real beginning of it. Now, I could go in and have a bunch of examples of how this language migrated and changed, and, and but I'd probably do it at a service. I think you need someone who knows the linguistics a lot better than I do. And someday I would like to get one on and talk about Welsh properly, because I, I think as someone who's a, who's a monolingual person, pretty much, who only understands bits and pieces of other languages, whose best other language is actually Spanish, which isn't saying a whole lot, it's difficult for me to do justice to this and to give you a good example and a good understanding of this. But I do think it's important to know how it came about, why it's important, how it merges within the greater cultural influences like Latin, and then how the identity of the people of Wales is wrapped up into it. Because, make no mistake, the language of Wales, even for people who aren't able to speak it, is still important. It still has meaning. Yes, there are people who write into the daily papers and complain about why we have to have all this Welsh stuff around. But the reality is, is that the population of Wales isn't defined by the language, but it is definitely a part of who they are. It is a part of how Wales came to be. And it becomes incredibly important once the English take charge of Britain, and more importantly, Wales in this case, there is this whole holding on to the language as if it was the last vestiges of your national identity. And I think that's incredibly important to the Welsh populations, particularly in the western and northern halves of Wales. My family personally still speaks Welsh over there, and I, it was one of those experiences where I knew I was missing something, because, to go on a personal story, at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, we went up and saw my relatives who live in North Wales, and got to hang around them for a day, and it was incredibly cool. I learned a lot about the area in that seeing it and kind of understanding what it was like for my ancestors living there. But I think the most important influence was realizing just how important Welsh is in that area. Everybody spoke Welsh to each other that I saw. My family, especially, all of them spoke Welsh. And it was obvious that it was their primary language and English was the secondary language because they had to adapt to me being around and my family being around who didn't speak Welsh. And that was interesting. It reminded me a lot of actually going into Hispanic homes in America and seeing people from Mexico and South and Central America who didn't necessarily learn English as their first language and now have to adjust for these English speakers and how they went about that. And it was very similar feeling. I felt kind of a little weird. Uh, but at the same time, it felt good to hear it and to hear people speaking it and that they cared about it. And make no mistake, Welsh continues to be cared about. And there are still a number of people that speak the language as their first language. There's still a number of people learning it as their second language. It still has meaning to Wales. And no matter what happens after this, no matter what happens to Welsh as a language, it is still embedded into the population. You can't go into Wales and not at least attempt to learn the national anthem, which you can't sing in English. It, it's fundamental to the construction of the society that we have now. And if you have a desire to learn the language, good on you. I have tried to learn a few times. I'm terrible at it, as you can tell by my pronunciation. But I really do think that it's important for people to continue this language. It is critical to the Welsh identity in ways that I don't think even people living in Wales fully understand.
And living in a country where we have bilingualism, but yet it's not exactly the same as the way it is in Wales, I sympathize and empathize with that population that, that that's their primary language and may feel that they're isolated and not being respected. And I also understand the opposite side of that, because as a, as a mono, monolingual speaker in Canada, you do lose some advantage for that. So it, it goes both ways, and, it's, and we'll get into this much more as we go through the history of Wales. Obviously, the language is critical to Welsh history and to the development of it. And like I said, I will try to do my best to pronounce things correctly. I will hopefully, at some point, get someone on who's, who can talk about the language properly and give you a much more detailed discussion about the linguistics and maybe word usage and all those things that I just can't do and, and, and would come off looking quite silly doing. But hopefully we can do that. I'm glad you're sticking with me. I'm so grateful for everyone who's listening. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Everything you've sent to me, said to me, tweeted to me it means so much. And it's so personally rewarding. I, I, I can't honestly tell you how much it means to me. And I hope to keep doing this as for a very long time to come. Uh, if you have questions, concerns, or comments, you can reach me at uh, Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can reach me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. You can contact me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. You can message me on there, and I do get them, and I do respond. Uh, if you have questions about anything we've discussed, if you want to straighten me out, which some of you have done, over some of the things I've said which were not entirely correct, and I have adjusted for them, all of that... I appreciate and I am so grateful to you guys. Thank you so much. Have a good day. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.